If you have a Bible, I encourage you to open it to John chapter 21 as we are in the middle of a sermon series all about what is the, the purpose of a church? What is the purpose of being together as God's people and serving God's mission of the Great Commission to go into the whole world and make disciples of all nations by, by sharing the good news that God has come in Jesus Christ to die for our sins, to rise from the dead, to give us the gift of eternal life. And so last week, we talked about the purpose of mercy, that as Christians, we have been so incredibly blessed with his gift of mercy in our lives, both spiritually Spiritually, by his comfort of forgiving our sins and removing the punishment that we deserve by, by placing it on Christ on the cross, but by also being by a loving father who cares for his children and provides for his children. And in response, we celebrate that good news of God's mercy by being merciful to the world around us, to the people in our lives, by comforting them when we can with words of encouragement and prayer and love and good news of the gospel and Jesus being for them. And we also bring God's mercy in our lives by meeting physical needs. And today, we're talking about fellowship. And that doesn't ever sound exciting, right? Like, there's, there's just no way I could kind of, like, most of you are like, oh, okay, yeah, fellowship, great. Now, what we think of with fellowship, the reason... Invite your friends. Pastor is going to talk about fellowship. Like it just doesn't usually ha happen with sermon series, right? Is because we think, oh, fellowship is simply about me and my three or four best friends in the church that I've known for decades. But I want you to see this morning that fellowship, according to God's word, is way bigger than that. And, and way more important for not just our enjoyment, but also for our purpose as a church and as Christians together. Because ultimately, fellowship is about our relationship with God. Throughout Scripture, especially the New Testament, the authors of the New Testament talk about how we have fellowship with God now, that you and I have friendship with God now because of what Jesus has done. And then they go on to say, okay, so then you take that friendship and that fellowship that you have with God, and you know what you're supposed to do with it? Just, just hide it and keep it to yourself. Be like, he's my best friend, and no one else can have him. Right? No. Some of you were already paying attention, and you said, no, we're supposed to go share. Yeah. The whole point is that, oh, now I invite others into this friendship with Jesus. Now I invite others into this fellowship with God the Father because of what Christ has done, not just for me, but for everybody. So as we dive into God's word here in John 21, we see this very incredibly famous story of the apostle Peter. And as we enter it, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have really awesome memories it's not a hard question. Yes, no, you got some good ones, right? But, right? You, how many of you have memories that make you laugh and bring joy to your heart, all right? How many of you have memories that they're beautiful and precious to you, but they kind of make you cry like happy tears? Anybody got those? Yeah. So, like, memories are incredibly powerful things, right? That when we have them brought to our minds, sometimes we see something, we smell something, or sometimes we're around people and they kind of remind us of someone and all of a sudden, they jar memory loose, right? A lot of times, our memories come to us when we're not even trying to think of them. They just happen. We see something. We smell something. We, we meet somebody or something happens, and we're transported back in time, right? And we're just like, oh, man, that reminds me of this one time. That was so amazing. So on the one hand, we have amazing memories. One of my favorite memories in the whole world is triggered by the baking of ginger snap cookies. Now, they're not any kind of ginger snaps. I don't care what you make, okay? I've had other people in my life be like, well, you gotta try mine. And I'm like, okay, that's nice. But my wife knows, like, I'm just, I'm not gonna eat your ginger snaps. I don't, okay, just stop them to me, okay? <laughs> because my grandmother had her own recipe that she made that got handed down multiple generations to all of us. And, like, she would make them this especially for the guys in the family, because we all went, we got into fights at Christmas. You're not supposed to get in fights at Christmas. I understand that. We would, we would count each other's 
ginger snaps. We're so into, we're way too competitive. We're like, how many did you get? A couple earlier, so that's got to come out of your talk. We were very weird about this, okay? But we love it. Anytime, though, I smell ginger snaps being baked or cooked, it takes me back a time to when I was in my grandma's house and having that, that time with her. She's in heaven now, but having that time with her and like, right? So sometimes we have things that happen around us and they, they transport us to amazing memories where we're like, oh, oh, what a great moment. But here's the flip side of all those happy feelings. How many of you have a bad memory? Show of hands. Everybody's got one, right? Now you're like, yeah, and I've been doing a lot of work to try to not remember it and never bring it up, so please don't talk about it right now, Pastor, right? Sometimes we have those bad memories. We're like, oh, no, I don't want to feel that again, experience that again, go through that again. Why? My feelings, right? And, and it's just like with the, the wonderful memories that we have. Sometimes it's smelling something or seeing something or being around certain people or whatever, and all of a sudden that that hard memory, that difficult memory, that painful memory can come up and bring all kinds of emotions with you. Now, the reason I bring this up is because in this story, Peter's going to have to deal with a bad memory. So Jesus has risen from the dead, right? And it's Easter has happened, and it's been amazing, and he's appeared to some of the disciples and everything. And yet what we understand from Scripture, the way Peter interacts is that Peter is wondering to himself, is Jesus okay with me? Right? Like, like he's been at all the appearances, but they haven't talked. And the last time that Peter saw Jesus before the resurrection was when? He was denying him. So if you've ever had a bad memory, <laughs> been haunted by something you said or did, and you're like, I don't can we just not bring it up anymore? I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to counter it. Like, Peter is feeling the ultimate version of that. And it's like, wow, Jesus came back from the dead. And because Peter's a human like you and me, I would imagine that the thing that he's thinking about the most is, and the last time he saw me, I was saying, I don't know him. And now they're out fishing because that's... That's what Peter did. <laughs> After the death of Jesus and everything, Peter's like, well, I'm getting on a boat. I'm going back fishing. Because he's like, well, Jesus is obviously done with me. Right? So he's out there fishing, and Jesus shows up in verse 4 of John 21. As day was breaking, and he stood on the shore, and he asked his disciples, do you have any fish? Which is a question Jesus had asked them earlier in the Gospels. And they tell, no, we haven't caught any fish. We've been fishing all day and all this stuff. And so Jesus did what he did earlier in the gospel and said, try tossing your net on the other side. Now, he's doing that on purpose because he did that earlier in the gospel. But it's also because it's kind of funny because Peter and all the other guys are professional fishermen. I would assume that like the first thing they would try is like, let's try the other side, guys. Like, I think they would have thought of that, but Jesus is like, hey, just in case you guys haven't yet, just throw it on the other side. And they catch a bunch of fish, and it's amazing. And I love that John's like, I, by the way, John is the unnamed disciple here, the, the one whom Jesus loved, the guy that got to the tomb first because he was faster than Peter. They're all fishing. And it, I love that John's just like, just so you know, <laughs> I was the first one to figure out I was Jesus. Right? No one else did, but it was me. <laughs> all right. Now, John's also writing this after all the other apostles have died. So they can't really get mad at him for it. <laughs> He's like, it's Jesus. And what's Peter's reaction? I'm going to jump into the lake and start swimming. And then I love John's little de detail of all the other disciples stayed in the boat and rowed because they weren't that actually that far away from shore. You guys got to laugh at that. John's like, and Peter was dumb. Again, we all just kind of... It took us a whole minute <laughs> to row back in, and Peter's like, I'm going to swim. But they get there, and here's what happens. Verse 9, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. 
Now, this is probably one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. And we look at it, we go, Jesus is making breakfast. What's so special about it? Well, here's what's special about it. John includes an incredibly important detail for you and me in this verse. When they got on land, what's the first thing that they, he says they see? A charcoal fire. Now, the Greek word for charcoal fire is anthrakia, and it only shows up two times in your whole Bible. Once here in John 21, where the resurrected Jesus is making breakfast for the disciples, the only other time that word shows up in the entire Bible is earlier in the Gospel of John, when Jesus is being arrested and tried and beaten, and Peter is standing outside watching, warming himself by a charcoal fire. It's also that moment where Peter looks at Jesus, sees what's happening to him, and gets asked three different times, don't you know who Jesus is? And three different times, Peter says around a charcoal fire, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. And then John's gospel includes the line, and then Jesus looked at Peter, and then the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered what Christ said. And he's devastated. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around a fire before or a grill or done some smoking on a smoke, right? What happens to your clothes afterwards? No matter where you go, you're like, I've watched it five times. They're like, did you just cook today? You're like, nope. What does it smell like? The fire, it sticks with you. John's including this detail for a reason. Peter's like, oh, it's the Lord. I'm going to swim over there. He gets out of the water, steps onto the shore, and what's the first thing that he sees? A charcoal fire. I wonder what memory is coming to Peter's mind in that moment. Probably not not the happy memory of, oh, there's fish and bread, just like the feeding of the 5,000. Wasn't that really neat? I think John's including this word on purpose because... For Peter, he's going to go, oh, a charcoal fire. The last time I smelled one of those, the last time I was around one of those with Jesus, I said I didn't know him. So now they're sitting around this fire, and Peter gets the fish because Jesus asked them to. And Jesus said to them in verse 12, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord Jesus. He came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so also with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And in verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter. Now, I just want you to put yourselves in the place of Peter for a moment. What is one topic you would love to not be brought up at that breakfast table. (laughs) Remember when you denied me three times? Right? Now, all the other disciples abandoned Jesus too, so they're dealing with their own need of repentance and forgiveness. But Peter's was just, like, you don't get any more bold in your defiance than Peter got in that moment around that first charcoal fire where you're being asked, do you know Jesus? And he goes three different times. And no, I don't know him. I've never met him. I don't know him. I want nothing to do with him. And if you're Peter, you're sitting there at the second charcoal fire with Jesus. I guarantee you, Peter remembers what happened at the first. And Jesus looks at him and says, hey, Peter, let's talk. Anybody ever had someone in your life say, hey, we need to talk? and you just get like a cold feeling down your spine. You're like, nothing ever good follows the phrase, we need to talk, right? (laughs) Like, I don't care what your relationship with that person is. As soon as you hear, we need to talk, you're like, whatever. It's it's over now. So Jesus looks at Peter and says, hey, we need to talk. Simon Peter, son of John, Do you love me more than these, pointing to the other disciples? Do you love me more than your brothers? Which they would have been close after three years together and knowing each other before then even. Do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now notice how Peter doesn't say, I love you more than these. He just says flat out, 
you know I love you. Because Peter's not thinking about the other disciples right there. He's thinking about the last time someone asked me if I loved you, if I knew you, I said no. But I want to make it really clear to you right now, Jesus. I'm really sorry. I, I really do love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. <clears throat> he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Now here's something I've always thought about with this verse. When Peter says, you know everything, meaning you know what happened at the first charcoal fire. You, you know that I said I didn't know you three different times. From an earthly perspective, when Jesus needed the disciples the most, right? So Peter's telling him, you know everything. Like, I'm not going to say it out loud, but I know, Jesus, that you know what I did. I know you know what my sin was. Even if around, which they weren't to hear it, it was just Peter and Jesus. Peter's saying, like, I but I know you also know that I love you. And what does Jesus say to him? Feed my sheep. Now, this is a very simple response. Peter, tend my sheep, care for my sheep, feed my sheep. Important for you and I, not just for Peter. Because what Peter says that is true about him and Jesus is also true for you and I. Lord, you know everything. So here's what this means. <clears throat> he knows everything. Like there's no other way to read it or translate it. And here's what that means for you and I. He knows that Peter denied him at the first charcoal fire. Even though none of the other disciples were around to see it or hear it. That means that every time you and I come into worship and, and we go through confession and absolution and we confess our sins, and maybe there's some that we are confessing that nobody knows about, but Jesus already knows everything. Or maybe there's some that you're trying to keep hidden from everybody, including him. And yet what I love about Peter's brutal honesty in this moment is just like, look, Jesus, you, you know everything. You know what I said, you know what I did, you already know it. And so what happens to you and me is when we confess that to Jesus and we say, you already know everything, we get scared. Like, like Peter's hurt. Like, Peter does not want to have this conversation because like, you and I as humans don't ever want to have that conversation of, oh, okay, here's what's going on thing yeah and so we get scared we say, I, don't, I don't I don't want Jesus to know everything I don't want to confess it I don't want to be honest about it and yet the good news for you and I the good news for Peter is how Jesus responds to him he says what feed my sheep tend my sheep love my sheep he doesn't look at Peter and go you know what, Peter, you're right. I do know everything. And remember that last time that you and I sat around a charcoal fire together and how you denied me three times? Goodbye. I'm done with you. That's what we think is going to happen. Right? That's how humans operate with one another. Right? Like, oh, yeah, I remember. I do know everything. You're right. I do know what you did to me or to them. And now I'm going to destroy you. Yet what does Jesus do in response to Peter's denial? How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three. How many times did Jesus ask him a question? 
And how many times did Jesus tell Peter, go feed my sheep? Three times. What he's doing is he's showing Peter, here's how complete and total my forgiveness for you really is. You deny me three times, I'm gonna forgive you three times. And when he says, feed my sheep, what he's doing, he's commissioning Peter as his disciple. He's saying, look, Peter, I know you don't think you're worthy enough. I know you think you've messed up too many times to follow me and to serve me and to make a difference and to participate in my mission. Yet, I'm going to tell you three different times, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Because Peter knows what he did. And a lot of times we know what we did. And we think, there's no way Jesus will forgive it because don't tell me what it was. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna play a brave, vulnerable game right now. Nobody likes being vulnerable, but I'm gonna make you do it anyway. You're welcome, I love you, okay? <clears throat> How many of you, when we do, do confession and absolution and we have the time for private and silent reflection, we can use your own words, have ever showed up two Sundays in a row and had to apologize to Jesus for the same sin two weeks in a row. Anybody? Show of hands. You don't have to tell me what it was because you're forgiven, okay? Here's what the devil wants you to do with that. He wants you to give up and say, okay, I did it again. Now God's gonna be really annoyed with me. There's just no way he's gonna forgive me for the 757th time I've done this thing. I've been going to church every week my whole life. And every time I go to confession, it's the exact same thing. And we think God's going to get worn out in forgiving us. Peter denied Jesus three times. Did the exact same. He had three chances. All he had to do was go, yeah, I know who Jesus is. And each time he couldn't do it. So how does Jesus respond to Peter? Each time, look, hey, Peter, I know you denied me once, but feed my sheep. I know you denied me a second time, and go ahead and feed my sheep. I know you denied me a third time, go ahead and feed my sheep. It's a reminder of the extravagant grace and love of Jesus, not just for Peter, but for you and me. And every single time we feel like we're caught around a charcoal fire going, I can't believe I'm here again. I can't believe I'm doing it again or saying it again or behaving this way again. And instead of Jesus discarding us and go, you know what, you're right, that's a big number. I can't believe you've done it that many times. He already goes, yeah, I already, I already know everything. And instead of discarding us and setting us aside and saying, you know what, I'm gonna work with John because he's the disciple whom I love and he's the first disciple to figure out that it was Jesus on the shore. I'm gonna work with John. But if you're like Peter, good luck. But that's not how Jesus works. He takes John and he also takes Peter and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to feed my sheep. See, when we're talking about fellowship, that's the root of it. It's the fellowship that you and I have with Jesus around a charcoal fire. Where sometimes we're being reminded and remembering, I've come up short. I've denied him. I've sinned against him. I've sinned against others. And yet, at that same moment, Jesus says to you and to Peter and to me and to everybody else, um, feed my sheep. This is a beautiful reminder that, that no matter who you and I are, what we've done, how many times we've done it, how many times we've said it, how many times, like Peter, we've denied Jesus with our words and our actions and our sin, that each and every single time, he reconciles us back to God. He brings us into fellowship with the Father and says, this is where you belong. So it's good news for you and I. And what Paul does in our Second Corinthians reading is he says, okay, all that wonderful fellowship and reconciliation that God has done in Jesus Christ for you and me, I want you to now go out into the world and do it for other people, right? 
He says, we conclude this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him. So what Paul is summarizing is this moment here with Peter and Jesus saying, Jesus died for Peter. He has reconciled people like Peter back to himself, back to the Father. Jesus died for you, and he has reconciled you back to himself and back to the Father. And then Paul says, and here's the whole purpose of it, so that you don't live for yourself anymore, but you live for him, right? So there's a purpose to us being reconciled back to God, having fellowship with the Father. And that purpose is to go and feed his sheep. That purpose is to go and live for him and bring that good news of forgiveness and grace and reconciliation to other people in the world so that they will know what? Jesus forgives them and loves them and has died for them as well. Paul says he died for who? Just me and my friends. What did it say? It's one word, all. Who does that include? All y'all, there you go, all right? So what's our purpose? Is to live for him and invite all to enjoy that fellowship with the Father because of what Jesus has done for him and for her and for all of them. Right, so we, we celebrate and we rejoice that like, like Peter, we get to sit around the charcoal fire and be like, I have really messed up, Lord, and enjoy his grace and forgiveness where he says, feed my sheep. I still have a purpose for you. I, I have still redeemed you and forgiven you and commissioned you to go into the world and bring that grace to others. <clears throat> About Peter, this is really obvious, but sometimes we forget the obvious. He doesn't stay at the charcoal fire with Jesus for all eternity. Isn't that like a really good point? Thank you for following along. And you're like, yeah, of course it's obvious. Of course they're going to get up. Like we've read Acts. We've seen Peter does other stuff. Here's what we forget. How awesome of a moment, though, is that for Peter? To be sitting at the charcoal fire again with Jesus, and instead of being condemned, he's forgiven and recommissioned and given a whole new purpose for his life. If it was me, it'd be like, let's just keep eating together, Jesus. <laughs> we'll just we'll keep the fire going. We'll just be you and me. We never have to leave. But in order for Peter to do what Jesus called him to do, to actually feed his sheep, Peter has to do what? He's got to leave the fire. And he said, I, I got to go find other sheep. I got to go find other people so that they can know who the shepherd is that brings them back home. See, fellowship is actually really awesome because <laughs> it's a summary of the gospel. It's a, re, it's a visual picture for you and I that, you no, know, Christ died for all. And like Peter, we all have moments where we have stood around one charcoal fire and said, I don't know him. And the invitation of the gospel is to sit around another charcoal fire and have Jesus tell you, I forgive you, I love you, now feed my sheep because I've given you a whole life, whole new purpose and a whole new meaning. So when you and I get together in different ways for fellowship, it's a reminder of, oh, this is what Jesus has done for all of us. This is what Jesus has done for everybody else. And then like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, he's like, I encourage you and I urge you to go and do these things. So that's the other purpose of fellowship is that you and I get together and we remind each other, remember what Jesus did for you. You're forgiven, you're redeemed, you're loved. And then we encourage each other, we urge each other, we persuade each other to say, okay, let's go out into the world and bring that good news of reconciliation, grace, and hope in Jesus to more and more people so that they can enjoy fellowship with God the Father and fellowship with us. Now, that's kind of the end of my sermon, but I'm going to keep talking. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're like, woo, yay. <clears throat> um, so 
we're going to have some ushers come in, and they're going to walk around the sanctuary, and everybody's going to get a handout. So that's the dramatic moment right now. They're going to start handing these things out. And <clears throat> some of our awesome members help put these together, and it is a tool to help you remember what we've been talking about the last few weeks, and we're going to be talking about the next few weeks. All right, so we're talking about our purpose as a congregation, our purpose as a church according to God. God's word. And so last week, I told you all four of the weeks that we're going to talk about. So I know you already memorized them. You didn't forget it all because nothing happened to you since last week, right? So now you're going to have a handy dandy handout. And if you lose it, guess what? I will give you another one because I am so kind and loving and generous. All right. So I just want to take a few moments here to kind of explain looking at why you're looking at it and, and what I want us to do the church together with it. So our spiritual care and leadership and a few other uh, members have been getting together over the last few months. We've got a few more coming up and walking through different things things like this, where we've been going through God's word and praying about what he would have us to do in our ministry and as a church together. Now, the reason you're getting this is because Ephesians 4 says that the ministry is by and for the saints. So if you believe in Jesus, it's Pentecost, you have the Holy Spirit in you, you're a saint. And I don't like, you know, like, I don't really feel like one. Well, that's okay. You still have the Holy Spirit, and that makes you a saint. And that's what Ephesians 4 means, is that the ministry is to be done by the saints of the church. So when we talk about mercy and fellowship and missions and worship, what that means is that all of us together, as followers of Jesus together, are doing this work together. And we might serve in different areas and in different ways, but we're all participating in serving Jesus and his mission and purpose together. At the top, the ultimate purpose comes from John 17, verse 3, where Jesus tells us that eternal life is found by believing in him. And that's our ultimate goal, right? As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 in our reading today, like we, he's reconciling the whole world. He died for all. We want as many people as possible so if you lose it just let me know and I'll give you I will not judge you I will tell you feed my sheep and hand you another piece of paper okay all right we have mercy missions worship and hospitality in the second column there's a few bible verses for each one I've all preaching on each one as we go through it right and so next week guess what we're going to talk about anybody got a good guess there you go, see? It's very simple. Now, there's a lot of other Bible verses for each one. I just wanted to give you a few to get you started. In the next column, though, what we do is a summary of what does that mean for us, our attitude and our behaviors, okay? And then the final column is it starts with prayer. And I told uh, our leadership and spiritual care team members at the last meeting that this was their homework assignment was to go home and pray. And they all told me they were going to, and I believe them. So what we're doing now is we're inviting the whole congregation to pray for the church and pray for God's work among us together. Because why? Because Ephesians 4 says the ministry belongs to the saints. All right. And here's a firm belief I have. <clears throat> Prayer is not the thing that we throw at the end to go like, oh, okay, we made this really awesome plan. We had a voters meeting. We did these things. We had all these. Well, Lord bless it. Amen. Now, I've done that in my life. It's not right, but I've done it, okay? I'm confessing my sin to you, okay? I'm sure you've done that in your life or your plan's going to hell in a handbasket. You're like, dear Lord, please rescue me and come up with something better. So what I would like for us to do as a church church is to take very seriously the importance and the power of prayer to be the first thing that we do. So I wrote some scriptures there for you to look up and read on your own. We have 
1 Chronicles 16, 11, Psalm 127, verse 1, and Ephesians 3, verse 20 to 21, to use those as your reminders and your God for praying. So here's your homework assignment as a church. And you're going to get this homework assignment each week because we're going to have handouts every week to remind you in case you lose it. But here's what I want to see as a church, all of us coming together and praying, that we would be united in prayer and saying, okay, Jesus, we want more people in Kansas City and in our works, in our neighborhood, in our community to believe in you. We want more people throughout the world to know who Jesus is. So we're going to pray together as a church for God to guide us us on what does that work look like for us here and now, all right? So here's your homework. So I wrote it in each box for you. You forget. Look, how, I'm so helpful today. All right. How will I? So that includes who? <laughs> all y'all. Yeah, so you're learning Texan. All right. Includes all y'all. Why? Because I don't want you to walk out here going, someone else will do it. I don't have to. No, your I, that's you. So how will I pray about God's work of mercy, God's work of fellowship, God's work of mission, God's work of worship and hospitality in and through this church? So everybody okay with that? Everybody okay with praying? All right, you got your homework assignment. You can do it. I believe in you. And here's what I also believe that God hears our prayers and that God promises to work through his people, including all y'all, all right? So we're gonna join together as a church over the coming weeks and months and take very seriously praying to God for him to guide us on what is our work and ministry look like together and how can we work together as a whole church to see as many people know the love of Jesus as possible, all right? Fair enough? All right, that's, now that's the end of me talking. All right, I'm going to say a prayer for us, and then we'll join together in the creed. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of fellowship that you have given to us through your death and resurrection, that you have reconciled us to you and the Father, no matter how many times we have sinned or messed up or said the wrong thing, that each and every single time you bring grace and forgiveness to us, and you invite us into your church, you invite us into your purpose and your mission of feeding your sheep, of bringing the good news of your grace and mercy for the whole world. May we be people who have rejoiced and received that good news, and as Paul commands, we go out into the whole world and tell everyone we know that Jesus has died for them. In your name we pray, amen.